Most of us drank copious quantities. You know, we could put down a case if we had to or finish off a bottle of uh, 7 and 7 with no sweat. But it came with the territory. All the icebreakers, at least to my knowledge, seem to be the same way. Every icebreaker sailor I ever came across were all pretty much the same. Their attitudes were the same. Their outlooks were the same. In the U.S. Coast Guard, the Polar Service, those ships assigned to ply the freezing waters and ice packs of the world's coldest oceans, could breed a certain kind of sailor, brave, capable, and a little crazy. And the ships themselves sometimes resembled asylums. Very close to an asylum. Hello, welcome to the Mighty Pen Podcast. I'm David L. Robbins, your host and founder of the Mighty Pen Project, a free writing program for veterans and their families, in partnership with the Virginia War Memorial Foundation here in Richmond, Virginia. Dave Schlitz served in the U.S. Coast Guard on board the West Wind, a polar cap icebreaker renowned in every port of call for its roistering crew. Dave, who stepped aboard the West Wind for the first time at age 18, didn't show up a seasoned Arctic saltwater swabby. He became one. In today's engaging episode, Sunek, Dave relates with wit, humor, and a sharp eye just how his transformation happened. Let's listen to Sunek, read by Ken Moretti. Then Dave and I will have a carousing chat about youth on the icy seas and booze. We were young men in those days, venturing past the normal bounds of civilization into little-known realms of ice and snow, following along the watery pathways of those daring and perhaps foolhardy men who had preceded us over the years. Many of those had perished, sailing the high latitudes where the sea seldom gave second chances, and sub-zero temperatures could kill in a heartbeat. Looking back, I still find startling the nonchalance with which we approach those journeys those voyages to lands that had only existed in our imaginations. We wind-class coasties were a different breed. Tough, resilient, often ornery for no good reason. Salt-stained, scruffy, armed with our Zippo lighters and marlin spikes. Standing weary watches amid raging storms. Sleeping in smelly berthing, sweating in the engine rooms, and freezing our cojones off as a flying bridge lookout. We may do with hot coffee from the galley, fresh-baked bread from the night baker, packs of luckies from the ship's store, photos from our girl back in the States, and letters from home received at odd and varying intervals. We lived beyond the pale, knowing when to skate and when to buckle down, as if our very life depended on it, as it sometimes did. It was high adventure and teeming drudgery only appreciated from the advantages of intervening decades. Early on a muggy June day in 1964, U.S. Coast Guard Cutter West Wind departed the Brooklyn Navy Yard, marking the start of our annual Greenland deployment. The wind, with her bow pointed straight across the East River toward Manhattan Island, eased away from the Navy Yard Pier, our next stop being Naval Station Argentia, Newfoundland. Those of us who were supernumeraries stood on the flight deck watching. Myself, Harry, and Crazy Kaz were watching family members waving from the pier. Standing with them were the Navy line handlers who had cast off our housers. Kaz looked over at me. Them shit-ass squids are going to be over at Dirty Dan's tonight, knocking down Colwyn's and hitting on all the broads. I got half a mind to flip him the bird. He raised his arm with the middle finger extended. Harry quickly pulled it down. Hey, you crazy son of a bitch. The old man's wife is standing right there. She sees you pulling that shit. Sure as hell, she's going to let the old man know and our asses will be crass. Yeah, I said, knock it off already. Kaz looked over at me. What are they going to do? Put me on West Wind and send me to Greenland? West Wind cleared the dock and kept heading straight across the East River instead of making the turn to port. 
were watching this, we started wondering when we were going to head toward the upper harbor. It slowly dawned on us that we were continuing to head due west, straight toward an apartment building on the Manhattan side of the river. Christ, said Harry, I think we maybe got us a steering casualty. Fortunately, that steering casualty was quickly solved, and a little more than halfway across, the wind slowly spun 90 degrees to port, and we headed down the East River. Our possible collision with Manhattan Island fortuitously avoided. Otherwise, we would have made the six o'clock news, with film at 11, of course, not the way you want to start out on a multi-month Arctic deployment. The wind stopped at Argentia, topped off the fuel tanks, took on fresh provisions, and headed for Hamilton Inlet, Labrador. There, as it turned out, we found very little ice and only stayed a few days before sailing north, stopping first at Greenwich in southwestern Greenland, a Danish Navy base. On the afternoon of Sunday, 21 June, that's the day that Jim Bunning of the Phillies pitched his perfect game against the New York Mets in the first game of a doubleheader at Chase Stadium. I was playing in a challenge football match against Danish Navy sailors in Grenig. I think they were bored playing against each other, and our arrival gave them a chance to play against some fresh meat. Only two of Westwind crew had ever played their version of football, which we called soccer before. Most of us had never seen a match played. Both guys explained what we were supposed to do and how we were supposed to do it. All of which turned out to be a lot of running around on our parts. What we lacked in skill, we tried to make up for with using hustle and determination. Well, as the match wore on, the Danes went up 3-0. Then, feeling sorry for us, they allowed us to score a goal. Three minutes later, they made a bad pass. We got control of the ball and kicked into the net. That woke them up, and they quickly scored two goals to show us just who was the better team and to put the game out of reach. The final score was 6-3. to three. We considered it a kind of moral victory, seeing as we did pretty good despite knowing next to nothing about the game. We, in turn, challenged them to a game of American football. They quickly declined. I guess we know who the real wusses are. Afterward, they invited us back to their quarters for some beers. Well, we, of course, never wanting to turn down a chance to drink beers, quickly accepted. Well, there we were, introduced not only to Tuborg, the beer that made Copenhagen famous, but to the fact that they drank their beer warm, <laughs> which we realized when they opened the closet and not the icebox. Still, beer is beer, and we drank an appropriate number of bottles of Tuborg. Hey, a really good question for beer bets at the bar except with the Phillies aficionados, is who was the winning pitcher in the second game. <laughs> it always works with Mets fans who didn't want to remember the first game to begin with. The answer, in case you are a Mets fan, is Rick Wise. From there, we headed north through the Davis Straits into Baffin Bay, held our annual scurvy blue-nose imitation, picked up a couple of USNS freighters inbound for Tule Air Base, and escorted them through the ice to DeLong Pier in Tule. The folks there greeted us with mixed feelings, happy that the resupply ships were once more arriving while knowing they had the West Wind crew to contend with for yet another summer. We spent the next few weeks escorting those resupply ships through the Baffin Bay ice fields to Tule. In port, we frequented the base clubs with their decent stakes and a $2.40 a case beers. I fly, you buy were words to live by. The renowned Tule stage was waiting at the end of the evening to transport our wasted asses back to West Wind. Late in July, we made a run up to Kanak, which is well north of Tule. I no longer remember why we went there, but I suppose there must have been a reason, even though there was no I and I in Kanak, which is probably for the best. I think summer in Kanak lasts from 30 June until about the late afternoon or 1 July. Then it's early autumn. By the time West Wind arrived, the temps were only getting up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The locals came out to West Wind in their boats looking to make some trades. Some of the crew standing alongside the starboard rail were offering to swap a few sacks of potatoes they had brought up from stores for some of their native arts and crafts. Bergy, one of this year's new crops of seamen apprentices, walked over to the rail to check out this interplay. Crazy Kaz grabbed him by the arm and drug him over beside the potatoes. Hey, we'll even throw in a seaman to sweeten the deal. Bergy tried to pull free, but Kaz had an iron grip on his arm. The Greenlanders were showing renewed interest now that Bergy was going to be part of the deal. In the end, 
All the haggling came to naught. Fortunately for the Bergie, none of the locals had any idea of what potatoes were, so Kaz and his buddies weren't able to make a trade. The kid, playing it safe, disappeared until after we left. Nobody would see Bergie again until we were six hours out. We did get to go ashore at Kanak, as we had last year at Clyde River Northwest Territories. As there were no docking facilities at either place, we went in, riding in the LCVPs. Kanak, if you can believe it, was an even more rustic than Clyde River. We were informed that one of the things the locals liked to do involved taking a gutted seal carcass and stuffing it with gulls or some kind of seabird, then throwing it out on the ice and snow behind the town. Then, as needed during the winter season, they would bring it inside and chop it up for dinner. Yuck. We made it a point not to eat anything while we were ashore. That evening, with us back on board, Westwind departed Canock, taking us back to Tule and the Airmen's Club. Putting wings in my watch cap became one of my proudest accomplishments on Westwind. It took me a long time to get it correct. Folding the brim down repeatedly, then just plain stretching it out during the night watches in the AG shack. Well, after finishing, I pinned my third-class pin on the front. I was very proud of my watch cap wings. I never saw another like it. And unlike when I painted a large P with red lead on the back of my foul weather jackets, nobody made me take it off. Later that summer, Westwind went up to Cane Basin, well north of Tule, for some hull stress tests. We were to ram the ice at varying speeds to see what effects that had on crushing the ice and hopefully not crushing the hull. Well, after all, you can only dump so much reinforcing cement in the bow before she gets nose heavy. One of the last runs was at flank speed or whatever is the fastest speed the snipes can crank out. The bridge had the enunciators pushed all the way down. I was told we were doing 16 knots when we hit the ice. The whole ship was shaking and vibrating like you would not believe. Pots and pans were rattling around in the galley, making a terrible racket. Coffee was sloshing out of cups. Everyone grabbed whatever was nearest, holding on for dear life. It brought back memories of riding the IRT when it's really hauling ass. None of us had ever been on a wind-class icebreaker going that fast or shaking that hard. Then, wham, bam, west wind slammed nose first into the ice. The hull survived and didn't need any more cement. The ice? Not so much. It got kind of crushed. We were kind of glad when the tests were over and done with. My understanding is that they also wanted the duty photographer to volunteer to go down on the ice to take some pics while the wind rammed the ice at varying speeds. <laughs> he declined. Like most of us, he may have been a little wacky, but he wasn't stupid. At least not for the amount of money E4 pay being offered. Afterward, the old man took a short run up Kennedy Channel to see what he could see. Probably just more ice. We hit 81 degrees north latitude, only 540 miles from the North Pole, the farthest north I ever got. The old man had us come about and head back to Tule, and for us guys, more fun times at the Airmen's Club. That year, instead of Halifax, West Wind went to St. John's, Newfoundland for R&R. This was the first time the wind was allowed back into St. John's after being banned for a number of years. They had us tie up just down the dock from a Russian fishing trawlers. The Ruskies immediately put up a barricade of packing crates between us. We initially thought it was to keep their guys from defecting, but then we thought it was more likely that they had heard how good the Westwind crew was at Cumshaw. After a couple days, we got orders to assist in the rescue of a ship somewhere down past Cape Race. The wind got underway from St. John's as quickly as possible. Oh, I imagine the Ruskies were happy to see us go. After a day and a half of searching and heavy weather, we received word that the vessel was now okay and no longer in need of our assistance. Hooray! Back to St. John's and some more fun. When we got back to St. John's, we could no longer dock at our old berth. The space had already been assigned to another ship and had to moor at an old wooden dock at the north end of the harbor. On our second night, tied up at that old wooden dock with its just as old and dried out wooden shed, Westwind experienced a bad stack fire shortly after the guys got back from I&I. &I. That blew a silencer out of the stack around midnight. I am still surprised that the entire dock didn't burn down. Westwind's crew, however, were experienced at handling this kind of stuff. That year, Westwind was prone to stack fires, 
It was not unusual to see fire hoses laid out to the stack deck with pressure to the nozzle. Immediately, general quarters sounded for fire stations. As was to be expected, only the duty section was sober enough to be able to fight the fire, but they were enough. Within minutes, the duty section fire team had the situation well in hand. In less than an hour, they were securing from general quarters. All of us newly returned inebriates mustered up on the forecastle while the duty section handled everything. When they had it all pretty much under control, the old man came out to the forecastle just to see what was with the just back from Liberty crew, who were sprawled out up forward. He made his rounds, checking on his crew, then stopped in front of me, looking down at the two guys next to me. One was laying on his belly with his head under the rail, puking over the side, while his buddy worked his right leg in a pumping motion. Every time he lifted the kid's leg up, the kid puked. When he put his leg down, the kid stopped. The old man stood there, watching this for a couple of minutes, then walked away, slowly shaking his head. I could almost hear him saying, Why me, Lord? On the third night of our being moored at that old wooden pier, Candy asked Carl, one of the seamen returned from Liberty, after consuming copious quantities of alcoholic beverages. After he had gone down the ladder to forward berthing, the kid looked around, let out an ear-piercing scream, ran up the ladder, out onto the forecastle, and jumped over the starboard side. We were moored port side, too. A bunch of the guys chased him up out onto the deck. Kaz grabbed a life ring attached to the side rails, sailed it down to old candy ass in the water, hit him in the head, and cold cocked him. We had to get the duty swimmer to go fish him out of the harbor. After being pulled out of the drink, the guys just dumped him into his rack, and that was that. I and I was not the time to be sweating the petty shit. Westwind left St. John's en route once again for the high Arctic. On our way back to Thule, we made a port call at the airbase in Sundrastrom Fjord. During that visit, I tried to finish off the entire supply of Bacardi rum they had on hand at the Airmen's Club. I'm only guessing now, mind you, but I think they perhaps still had a bottle or two left when I decided to call it a day and go back to the wind. I stood, wobbled a wee bit, then staggered outside. Sitting down on the front steps, I waited for the bus back to Westwind, anchored in the fjord a few miles west of the airbase. Fortunately, I sat by the edge of the steps. When the pepperoni pizza decided that it no longer wanted to remain in my stomach, all I had to do was lean over the side and let the urge to regurge take its preordained course. Oh, the guys helped me onto the bus because I could no longer walk unassisted. Then off the bus and onto the Greenland cruiser for the ride back to Westwind. Bill Hackett, the duty boatswain, tumbled me into the after compartment where I scared the crap out of some poor F.A. who scrunched himself in a corner as far away from me as he could get. In my mind, that whole trip back only took five or six or ten seconds. And I haven't the faintest idea of how I got out of that aft cabin after we got back to the wind. Uh, be that as it may, there was no way I could climb up the Jacob's Ladder to quarterdeck. Hell, I couldn't even stand up. Some enterprising bosun mate climbed down to the Greenland cruiser, tied a length of hawser line around my waist. Then he and a couple of duty section guys pulled me up the port side like a proverbial sack of potatoes. I haven't even a damn clue as to how I got to my rack and forward berthing, except I know it definitely wasn't under my own power. Woke up the next morning with the absolutely worst hangover. Any movement brought abject pain to the old noggin. My throat felt like rough sandpaper, my teeth itched, and my tongue was asleep. Almost enough to make me swear off booze, at least for a week or so. I felt kind of surprised that I didn't get put on report. But then this was West Wind, where this kind of stuff wasn't all that unusual. The end of August found us back in Thule, where we waited for the last of the resupply vessels to clear Wollstenholm Fjord and the port to be closed down for the long, long winter. It was the third week in September when the wind finally hauled ass out of Thule for the season. By then, it was snowing almost every day. Not a whole lot at once. It would snow for a couple hours, stop for a while, then snow for a few more hours. Temps were mostly in the upper teens. Sunrise at 0900 and sunset a little after 1500. Summer was definitely on the wane. We got through the Baffin Bay ice with little trouble scooted through the Davis Straits with decent weather. Then the wind stopped in Godhob, the capital, 
for a couple of days. Visited a few shops looking for souvenirs, paid in Yankee dollars, got change in Danish kroner and ore. 100 ore equals 1 kroner. At that time, the going exchange rate was 7 kroner to U.S. dollar. I especially liked the one Danish coin with a hole through it. It had a polar bear, an image sacred to West Wing Coasties on one side. It is still the only Greenlander coin that I have managed to hold on to all these years later. One of my jobs on the wind was to copy scores off AFRS radio, then type them up and post them for the crew. I would occasionally do that during summer with baseball. 1964 was the year my Phillies got hot and stayed that way all summer long as they won game after game after game, spending the entire season in first place. Until, well, you remember. They went from the high of Jim Bunning's perfect game in June against the Mets at Shea to a low of 10 straight losses in September when they were up six and a half games with 12 to go and blew it as the Cards took advantage of that great Phillies collapse. But once football season rolled around, it was a different story. I spent every Saturday glued to the receiver trying my damnedest to copy scores down as the announcers rattled them off. With lots of effort, I usually managed to get a lot copied, mostly the teams from the eastern half of the country, which is where most of the guys were from. Then I'd type them up, run off a dozen or so copies on the mimeograph machine, and stick the sheets up around the ship. I also included World Series scores and some results from the NHL. Sometimes I would write up sports happenings and mimeo them as well. My all-time favorite story was when Kenny Wareham of the Chicago Blackhawks was reported to have suffered a broken neck during a hockey game. The announcer followed up that with a report that stated Kenny was expected to be out of action for maybe two weeks. <laughs> Baseball players would go on to disable this with a hangnail. West Wind came down to Halifax late into October that year, mooring at HMCS Staticona, the Royal Canadian Naval Base in Halifax. We would be doing end-of-season standby until the last buoy tender finished working Hamilton Inlet. After noon chow on our first day in port, I put on my almost, but not quite new, dress blue whip cords with my spiffy polar bear cuffs and headed downtown. I walked into my old stomping grounds on Spring Garden Road, the Candlelight Lounge, and found the same guy was on duty behind the bar. He said, you want the usual? <laughs> yep. And he whipped up a Bacardi and Coke with a twist of lime, just the way he had 14 months earlier. Oh, I was known to generously indulge myself in my favorite drink. And I was a good tipper. We had acquired Danish coins in Greenland, which in Halifax we passed off as having the same value as Canadian coins. Well, at that time, one Danish krona was the equivalent of seven U.S. cents. For 50 ore, one half of a krona, we could get a cheeseburger and fries. Uh, it was the 60s, remember? And for another 25 ore, we could get a Coke. In other words, we were getting a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke for what amounted to less than 10 cents U.S. Way cheaper than McDonald's. However, we didn't do this in bars. Figuring it wasn't too swift to piss off the barkeep. That would just be asking for trouble, and you know we didn't like to do that. Yeah, right. One of the delights of Halifax that I had first discovered during the 61 deployment, fish and chips, were again on our menu. Originally, I had slathered ketchup all over the chips and the fish. I had since discovered the delights of malt vinegar as a much better replacement for ketchup. It added a certain je ne sais quoi. Near the entrance to HMCS Datacona was a chippery located in a row house. I would often stop on my way back from Liberty and get an order to go. Tables and chairs could be found in the parlor. Orders were placed at the serving counter in the dining room. The fish and chips were fried up in the kitchen. The walls, the floors, the tables and chairs, and the serving counter were all covered in this thin sheen of frying grease. Tacky, maybe, but the fish and chips were tasty. Upon getting my order, I'd open the bag and I'd spritz it with malt vinegar, reclose the bag, and head back to West Wind. On board, I would plop my butt at a mess deck table, open the bag, now oozing grease and malt vinegar, <laughs> and sate my rum-infused appetite. I would invariably have to fend off duty section guys looking to catch a chip or two. With our last act in Halifax, we purchased our duty-free liquor ration from the local ship's chandler. Back in 61, it had been one gallon allowed, or in our case, five-fifths. 
all purchased at duty-free prices. My five bottles, two-fifths of Bacardi, two-fifths of Canadian Club, and one of Seagram's VO, cost me just under U.S. $7. Unfortunately, under Jack Kennedy, of all people, the allowance was greatly reduced, and I had to settle for a fifth of Bacardi and one of CC. We finished off our standby time in Halifax and sailed for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Fireboats escorted us through the upper harbor, their water cannons shooting geysers high into the sky. We moored portside too, all the way out by the old hammerhead crane, greeted by families, girlfriends, and Coast Guard brass. As soon as the lines were doubled and the gangways put out, the visitors hurried on board to greet their guys, finally home again after five and a half months in the faraway Arctic. Two sections were granted liberty, collected their duty-free booze, headed down the gangway with their families and girlfriends for a night of celebration. West Wind was quickly hooked up to shore power and water. Sea showers were again a thing of the past for a few months anyway. After all the brass departed, the duty section broke out bottles of booze purchased or swapped from guys going on liberty. By 1800, just about everybody was at least slightly buzzed. Yeah, right. We were all drunk as the proverbial skunk. As usual, the Coast Guard District Office transferred a few brand new SAs only days out of boot camp to West Wind. The poor kids were scared shitless. They were reporting on board West Wind, a ship that they had only heard bad stuff about, and were now finding it filled with nothing but mean motor scooters and bad go-getters. Here they found themselves in the midst of a drunk, wild-eyed, bearded crew that looked and acted like a grubby renegade pirate from the far Caribbees. Lombardo, Dowson, and myself were transferred back to the RCC aerology office in the Bowling Green Station Customs House within a week. When my turn came, I stuffed my transfer orders into my AWOL bag, saluted the flag flying on the fantail, hoisted my sea bag over my right shoulder, picked up my AWOL bag, stepped past the gangway and down the brow for what I knew would be my last time. As I set foot on the pier, I turned and looked back at West Wind, realizing that part of my life was over. With a small lump in my throat, I knew from then on I would only be a wind-class coastie in my heart. I was always amazed that the winds lasted as long as they did, given the stresses of ice ops in on a year-in, year-out basis. Pounding through three, four, five, six or more feet of ice, rolling through stresses of heavy swells as only a keelless ship can do, maintaining engine and electrical parts that were state-of-the-art in the early 1940s, operating with whatever could be begged, borrowed, or stolen, uh, sorry, unofficially appropriated. Cumshaw is still a word to live by. While we didn't mind busting our ass when necessary, when the chips were down, we were ready. We also very much liked smoking, drinking, and chasing after the women's, all of which seemed to be frowned on nowadays. We also held numerous prayer meetings in out-of-the-way places below deck. Lots of those on the wind. We worked hard and we played just as hard. We stood our watches, tended to our daily routines, watched each other's back. And yeah, we bitched, grouse, and complained about anything and everything. But we were always prepared when the time came. Well, most of us anyhow. There's always that 10%, you know. Unlike the Deep Freeze folks, who were awarded the Antarctic Service Medal, we considered our polar bear cuffs as our award for Arctic service. A lot of us had Liberty Cuff polar bears on our dress blues. Almost couldn't wait until clear of the ship and off base to roll those cuffs and let people know we were wind-class coasties. Here is a poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. I'm joined in the studio by one of my favorite storytellers, Dave Schlitz. Dave, you are renowned in all the Mighty Pen classes you've taken as a particular kind of storyteller, and that kind of story is what we call picaresque. It's a journey. You, your stories are not burdened by plots. We don't sit listening to your stories and go, I can't wait to see how this turns out, or 
what's the twist in the end? Your stories are all in the details and the senses, and you reveal humanity more than plot. And this last story was just an epic journey. You said that you guys lived beyond the pale, that it was a, an amalgam of high adventure and teeming drudgery. And there's some constants, right, in these stories you tell. One of them is the cavalier attitude about danger, about what you were doing, where you were doing it, and the potential peril of these things. Now, my question is, was that just youth? Because, dude, I, I was young. <laughs> I didn't do anything close to that stuff. So was it just youth, or was this some sort of self-selecting community of, of brave inebriates? Uh, probably a little bit of both, because the way that the setup worked was half the crew rotated off every year. So new people came on to, for the next deployment to the Arctic. And they were kind of indoctrinated by the people who were already there who had assumed this attitude that, you know, you can't sweat the petty stuff. I need to jump in. A guy jumped overboard. Yeah. It, in very cold waters, if I'm not wrong. Right. And you guys hauled him out of the water, threw him in his rack, and you said, eh, we're not going to sweat the petty stuff. Now, from an outsider's perspective, okay, <laughs> I jumped off of a boat into what would have killed him, the temperature of the water in a minute or two. You guys threw him in his rack. When you saw that happen, it didn't strike you as, wow, you went, oh, God, somebody go get him. It was petty, petty stuff. You're right. In my entire career, I've only seen one guy actually totally wig out and not recover from it when, when I was on Staten Island years later. Most of the people, after they got over whatever the crazy stuff they did, went back to being themselves. The crew would watch them, or part of the crew would watch them, keep an eye on them, make sure they didn't go off the deep end. And if they didn't, they just became part of the crew again. So the stuff was tolerated. It was more trouble. If they had taken them away, we would have people saying, what was going on? They would, you know, we don't want that. <laughs> So what you're saying is, you didn't bring this with you. You got indoctrinated. You look, you didn't show up at the West Wind as a 19-year-old alcoholic, okay? You, you became one. And, and the West Wind and all the other wind ships, this was a culture that, was anybody immune to it? Did anybody show up and go, ah, I'm not going to drink, nah, I'm not going to chase the women's, nah, I'm not going to steal stuff? Or did everybody at some point succumb to this? Most did. There's probably people who drank less. What is less? You go out in Liberty and have a couple beers and that would be it. Oh. <laughs> Most of us drank copious quantities. You know, we could put down a case if we had to or finish off a bottle of uh, 7 and 7 with no sweat. But they came with the territory. All the icebreakers, at least to my knowledge, seem to be the same way. Every icebreaker sailor I ever came across was on one of the seven... American icebreakers were all pretty much the same. Their attitudes were the same. Their outlooks were the same, you know, except for personal quirks. Okay, but your mom kissed you on the cheek goodbye and gave you to the Coast Guard and said, take care of my boy, Dave. You didn't walk onto that ship able to drink a case, able to polish off a fifth of Jim Beam. You showed up, I'm going to assume, with some shreds of normalcy, right? What was the transformation like to walk on there and be surrounded by, frankly, what sounds like an asylum? <laughs> Very close to an asylum on there. It was different. We didn't know coming on. When the first time you go on, you don't know. You're not expected for any of this stuff. And basically, you start copying an attitude that says, I'm here. I'm going to be here. I better learn how to roll with the punches. And you gradually become part of the crew. It's not necessarily an overnight thing. For some guys, it was pretty close to that. They fit right in immediately. But uh, it became a learning experience. How about you? Did you fit in? What was, your, what was your transition? It took a while. Probably going on Liberty up in Argentia and hanging out with the guys. It, it started, I started to feel part of the crew. And you just sit there and you go out on Liberty, you go into the clubs and you sit there and you drink. Mostly at that time, I drank Bacardi. 
Oh, you must have been viewed as effete by, by your crew members. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's Schlitz and the, and the Bacardi. You're named after a beer. All right, I got this wonderful tableau. You're up on the bow. There's a crewman hanging off the deck, head under the rail. The other one of your buddies is pumping his leg like it's a pump, and he's puking with every pump. And the captain of the ship walks up. <laughs> he just shakes his head. Tell me about the old man. What, what kind of commander has, can shape this crew into an effective crew for a Coast Guard? This is the demanding duty you had. They were all different. Some were good, some were bad, some were in between. This particular one, I believe his name was Captain Barber, but don't quote me on that. Well, what was the, what was the consistent skill, though? Because they all were in command. What was the, how well, did they get work out of you guys? <laughs> Well, this is a big deal for them. There was not that many seagoing commands for captains. He was a four-stripe. Many of them had been on the ocean station vessels and some of them other vessels coming up. And none of them expected what they found when they got there, that we were what we were. Frankly, David, who could expect it? Yeah. He and the others, they would adjust then depending upon his personality. I don't think he ever quite got used to us. He was more concerned uh, having the ship function. As long as they could do what they had to do, he could let certain things slide. His efforts to come to grip with the crew as a crew, I don't think fully got fully realized, shall we say. Did your captains ever get to know you as individuals? Did they Oh yeah, no, you know the crew. That's yeah. part of your job is to know you may not know the name of every seaman apprentice, but he knew most of the guys. He knew who they were. He knew who the leaders were, who were in charge, and who were capable, and eventually who weren't. And that includes some of the officers, too, that he had to live with. It sounds like what he knew, what they all knew, is what you wrote at the end of that piece. We were ready, and we would stand up on watch, and we would do for each other, and we would do the job. And so he sees a guy blowing cookies over the deck and another pal pumping his pumping his leg. And while that's almost a form of insanity, <laughs> he it seems like your captains all shared the ability to see past that and to see the seaman, the crewman, the, the hardworking young man, the reliable coasty through all that. And that that to me is is a marvel of leadership. So the guy that you got transformed into when you stepped onto the West Wind, when you stepped off it on leave, when you came home to your mom, did you leave that shit behind? Or did you say, Mom, let's have a Bacardi and rum? <laughs> were you able to shut that off when you were back at your mom's table amongst your, your family? For the most part. Not entirely. It, it just was part of me. By the time I got back, in the mid-60s, my brother Jack was driving tanks in the Army. My brother Mike was in Vietnam with the Seabees, did three tours there. So we were all veterans by then. And coming home, we weren't the kids we were in the 50s, but we realized we were coming back to civilization, shall we say. And we tried to behave a little bit more. We still drank. All of us drank. But then so did my parents. Not like, I mean... Both were highball people, Canadian club, uh, that sort of stuff with ginger ale. You come from class people, man. Yeah. <laughs> My dad was just a plain old schnapps guy. At what point in your spectrum of life, from Coastie to now, did all the bad stuff melt away? You're clearly not a heavy drinker now. You're not that. No. Yeah. But there came a point when you had to say, hey, like you said goodbye to the ship. You saluted the flag on the fantail. You walked off. At what point did you salute the young Coasty that you were and walk off the fantail of that guy? At what point in your life did you leave him behind? I don't think there was ever a point. It was a very gradual transition. A lot of it is still there and is quite capable of rising to the surface given the circumstances. Okay, stop there. Give me that circumstance. Well, maybe next September when I'm hanging out with a whole bunch of West Wind Coasties at a reunion up in Baltimore. 
<sighs> so we could all sit there, be sitting there drinking. I no longer drink Bacardi because I can swill it down. But do you think for old time's sake, you might steal something <laughs> when you're in Baltimore? Oh, Just to keep your hand, you know, you don't want to lose those skills. Possible. <laughs> these, these guys, you know, if it's there, they, it's for the taking. Define cum shot. Getting the better part of every deal you make. You can trade three oranges for a crate of apples. And we got really, really good at it because Coast Guard did not have replacement equipment for us, and we had to go find it. And we found creative ways of finding it in places. When you played soccer with the Danes in that story, it was measuring your manhood. It was like, okay, we'll play their game, and they made sure they beat us. They showed us what was what. Then we said, all right, how about some football, some knockdown, drag out football? They're like, no thanks. So then you guys decided to play on neutral ground and drink. <laughs> it seemed that this, the West Wind, as much as any other stories I've ever heard about all the services, is still in the end about proving yourself to yourself. But even in those little moments, like meeting the Danes and playing soccer with them, it was still chest puffery, yeah? To an extent. We were just, it was all part of the adventure. We somehow subliminally understood that we were living a great adventure. Most people never get to do this. I don't think we realized how far beyond the pale we occasionally got, uh, how far out we were by ourselves. If you watch the Disney film, Men Against the Ice, which is about West Wind in part, she got trapped north going up to alert, and they wasn't sure what was going to happen. This was in the early days. They persevered through it. It's all part of the psyche of being a, a wind-class coastie. That's a military idiom, adapt and overcome. Uh, uh, last question, and this is a great segue. So you say at the end, looking back, you are now a wind-class coastie in your heart. Back when you were smoking, drinking, and I just have to say it, chasing the women's. What is it like? It's, it's so special. The, your relationship to your own youth is heartening. I, I frankly don't look back at myself as a young man and have that much affection for me. But you loved and do love yourself as a young man. Can you capsulize it for me? Is it pride? Is it amazement that you survived? Or did you prove yourself to yourself? Is it all the above? It's bits and pieces of it. It's like I knew I was along with, for the ride with all these guys. And deep in my heart somewhere, I knew I should make the best of it. It didn't always work out that way. There were some bad parts along the way. I normally don't try and dwell on them at all. It was hard at times being part of that. Young Dave Flitz walks in that door. What do you say to him? Hey. Uh, I'm glad you didn't stop there, man. I thought you were just going to say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know, at this stage of the game. I mean, there's a big difference between us. We would be two coasties finding one another, which is always brings that spark of recognition, the knowledge that we were part of something that most people don't even know about. Uh, not only for the wind class coasties, but the guys who served on the ocean station vessels, the white ones, working the buoys, the uh, shore stations, where they had to go out in these little old 40 boats and rescue people in the worst kind of weather imaginable with almost nothing of what you would call modern navigation equipment on them. You know what I love about that answer, David, is separated by many decades that young Dave Slitz walks in this door and you said it would be two coasties recognizing each other. Not you here and him there, but you're still a coastie. Yeah. And on that, I thank you for this wonderful interview and your friendship and great stories. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, man. Before we sign off today's podcast, I, I want to include one more short piece by Dave Schlitz. Dave tried his hand at poetry. And I have to say, the result was eloquent and moving, especially for those of us with more years behind than ahead. So please, as a gift from me, enjoy Remembering 
by Dave Slitz. Read by Ken Moretti. We have grown old now. The body aches and the bones creak. The meds no longer work the way they did. Our span of days grows shorter. It's already next week. Month. Year. Sometimes unbidden, memories come. Perhaps when we are sitting in a rocker on the front porch, watching early evening shadows slowly seep across the lawn, or snoozing in an easy chair in the living room as the old dog waits for us to play with her again. Perhaps a vague shadow crosses the mind, a fleeting image that slowly coalesces of our old ships, of our old stations, of our old buddies, as well as those we would have liked to have smacked up alongside the head. Guys we busted our ass with, got drunk on liberty with, and who had our back as we had theirs, and those guys who went out when duty called and never came back. Once more, pushing a 40 boat through heavy weather because folks need rescuing, working on the black-hulled buoy tender setting markers on highways of water, sailing on a small ship in a vast ocean keeping a lookout, banging through polar pack on a worn-down old icebreaker, knowing we would be back there in a heartbeat if we could, donning our chambray shirts and dungarees, with our white hats cocked any which way, always a little rough and tumble, drinking, smoking, chasing the ladies. It didn't matter if you were standing watch on one of the white ones or scraping buoys on the black hulls or driving forties across the harbor. When the chips were down and the job demanded our best, we were always ready and willing and able. And we remember. The Mighty Pen Project is a free writing program for military veterans and their families, offered by the Virginia War Memorial Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to learn more about the Mighty Pen or just send us your thoughts, email us at mppodcast at vawarmemorial.org or use the link in the podcast description. If you're a veteran or a family member of a serviceman or woman listening to this podcast anywhere in America, and you want to learn how to best write and tell your own powerful stories, you can sign up for one of our Mighty Pen writing workshops on Zoom. If you want to read today's pieces and many more, use the link to go to the Mighty Pen Archive. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it. Music for this episode was provided by Jackson Albrecht. Lastly, if you'd like to support the Mighty Pen's efforts to record and preserve these stories of service, adventure, and sacrifice, follow the charitable donation link in the podcast description. I'm David L. Robbins. I want to thank you for listening to the Mighty Pen Podcast. Folks, it's an honor.